Sadsville by Martin Roberts. Chapter One Tears streamed down the face of a glum-looking sun as it crawled above the horizon. A hedgehog, uncurled from its tight ball of prickles, wiped its eyes and decided to curl up again. A sheep, not generally known for expressive emotion, took a large clump of grass in its mouth and chewed. Gloomily. A horse in the same field snorted, huffed, puffed and went for a gallop to try and cheer itself up. And from behind the front door of a house a few fields away, a muffled, sniffing noise could be heard. Inside, Sandy, the saddest person in Sadsville, pulled another tissue from the box, wiped the tears from her eyes and blew her nose, noisily. <sighs> Not another day of feeling sad, she said out loud to herself. I need to cheer myself up. She turned on her computer and checked her Facebook, Twitter, WhatsApp, YouTube, Bebo and Pinterest accounts. Everyone she knew looked sad. She turned on her smartphone and someone had sent her a text. I can't stop crying, it said, followed by a gloomy face symbol. Sandy stared blankly at the screen and saw a reflection of herself in the shiny metal. Her eyes were red, her nose was red, her mouth drooped at the edges. This is rubbish, she said. Why is everyone in Sadsville so sad? Chapter 2 Meanwhile, in a small town, not a million miles away from Sadsville... Herman, the hero of our story, was just pouring some cold milk onto his breakfast cereal. He tested the temperature with his thermometer. <sighs> not too cold, not too hot, he congratulated himself. Herman lived with his great-aunt Edna in a small, neat house. His brothers and sisters had already left home when great-uncle Arthur died, so Herman offered to move in with great-aunt Edna to keep her company. He liked her home because it was full of old-fashioned things. Old clocks, old pictures, old scientific equipment from the days when Great Aunt Edna was a science teacher. He liked them because, well, he was rather old-fashioned himself. Even his name, Herman, was a bit old-fashioned. Mind you, Herman had always been slightly different from his friends. While other children his age were playing with their computers and video games, Herman preferred reading books and particularly looking at old maps. Some of the other kids called him Square, which he thought was a bit uncalled for. Herman preferred Eccentric, which he'd looked up in his favourite leather-bound dictionary. Eccentric, it said, deviating or departing from conventional or normal forms of behaviour. Herman decided he quite liked being eccentric, so when he found a cupboard full of Great Uncle Arthur's old clothes, he decided to wear them. Knee-length tweed trousers, tweed jacket with padded leather elbows, and a smart tweed flat cap. With strong walking boots, a compass, and a pair of old binoculars around his neck, he decided he looked like an old-fashioned explorer. All he needed now was an adventure. Chapter 3 Back in Sadsville, everyone was getting on with their day. The lady who ran the roadside snack bar stocked the shelves with cakes, biscuits and, of course, everyone in Sadsville's favourite, cheese and onion flavour crisps. She had to stop every few minutes to dry her eyes. <sighs> Another gloomy day in Sadsville, she lamented. She decided to cheer herself up with a packet of crisps, but these were no ordinary crisps. They were the finest hand-cooked crisps that money could buy, made at Sadsville's very own gourmet crisp factory. And everyone in Sadsville loved them. Chapter 4 Herman was looking through some of the books on his great aunt's bookshelves. He was particularly fond of the extensive collection of old train, bus and ferry timetables. Other might have considered them 
boring, but Herman could happily spend hours studying the long tables of times, routes and destinations. He traced his finger along the bookshelf and stopped on a timetable he was sure he hadn't seen before. Buses to the Vills, it said in large letters along the spine. The Vills? questioned Herman. Where are the Vills? Herman remembered from French class that the French word for a town or village was a ville, but France was a long way from his great aunt Edna's house. He opened the faded pages. There was a long list of places Herman had never heard of. Bordsville, Foolsville, Tiredsville, Slowsville, Latesville, Coldsville, Windyville. The list went on and on. Herman picked one at random and turned to the corresponding timetable page. But instead of the long list of times he'd expected, it said the strangest thing. The bus will arrive two minutes after you reach the bus stop. He turned to one of the other pages for a different ville, and it said the same thing. The bus will arrive two minutes after you reach the bus stop. <laughs> How very odd, thought Herman. This must be a very special bus if it goes to all these different places and knows when I'm at the bus stop. It sounds, he paused, like a magical bus. Just the sort that could take me on an adventure. Chapter 5 Back in Sadsville, Sandy was heading to school. Her mum and dad had left early for work, so she had to walk alone. She'd packed her own lunch of sandwiches, a chocolate bar and, of course, a packet of cheese and onion crisps. She locked the house and set off. At the end of the road, she noticed her friend, Ella. Ella looked sad. "'What's the matter?' said Sandy. "'Oh, I don't know. Just things are making me sad and I don't know what to do about it,' explained Ella. "'I know. Me too,' said Sandy. And she gave Ella a hug. They both felt a little bit better, knowing they weren't the only ones that were sad. "'Why are we always sad?' said Sandy. "'Surely this isn't how it's meant to be.' "'No,' said Ella. "'But I don't know what to do about it. "'Maybe there's someone that can help.' "'I'm sure there is,' they both said at exactly the same moment. "'And they laughed for the first time that day.' Chapter 6 Meanwhile, in that village, not a million miles away, Herman closed the front door of Great Aunt Edna's house, checked he had everything he needed for a day of adventures, and set off down the familiar road towards the local shops. A short distance from his front door, a bus stop had appeared. That's odd, thought Herman. I don't remember seeing that before. It certainly wasn't there when I went to bed last night. How strange! Even stranger was the timetable that was attached to the bus stop pole. Buses to the Vills, it said in big letters, and underneath it, it simply said, The next bus will be along shortly. The next bus to where? said Herman out loud. And how does it know when I'm... Is there... What if... But how can... Before Herman could get any more confused... A big red double-decker bus appeared over the crest of the hill. This in itself was surprising, as the only time Herman had ever seen a red double-decker bus before was when he went to London with his family for the day. He was in a small village a long way from London, so what was the bus doing here? Then he noticed something even more odd. This was a very old-fashioned double-decker bus, just like the one on the front cover of the old, dusty timetable he'd found on Great Aunt Edna's bookshelves. Old buses like this had a section on the front at the top which the driver could wind up and down to show different destinations. As the bus drew closer, Herman could read what it said. In white letters on a black background was written one word... Sadsville. Oh dear, that doesn't sound like a very happy place, Herman said to himself. But if that's where the bus is going, then I guess that's where I'm going. Chapter 7 
Sandy and Ella were sitting eating their lunch. I'm saving my crisps till last, said Ella. Me too, said Sandy. Then, oh no. She stopped. I've forgotten my crisps. I better go to the shop and buy some. I can't have my meal without crisps. They looked up just as a big red double-decker bus pulled in by the line of shops in the centre of Sadsville. I've never seen one of those here before, said Ella. Me neither, said Sandy. Thank you, said Herman to the bus driver, who appeared to be crying. <laughs> My pleasure, the driver sniffed as Herman got off. He doesn't seem very happy, thought Herman. As Herman walked down the street, he noticed that everyone seemed sad. All the people walking towards him were drying their eyes with hankies. Dogs with droopy jowls looked even more glum than usual. Even the flashing animated characters on the pedestrian crossing seemed gloomy. Why on earth is everyone so sad? thought Herman. Something very sad must have happened here. While he was mulling this over, Herman decided he needed a snack. He often found that he could think much more clearly after a chocolate biscuit or a piece of Battenberg cake. He noticed a cafe on the high street and arrived there at the same time as Sandy. After you, he said politely, as Sandy and him nearly collided at the door. Oh, thanks, said Sandy as they walked up to the counter. A packet of cheese and onion crisps, please, she said to the lady who was serving. Crisps, thought Herbert. What a good idea. On the counter was a big glass bowl full of packets of very special looking crisps. Brian's hand-cooked crisps, announced an elaborate sign. Made locally with the finest ingredients. Um, a packet of cheese and onion crisps for me too, said Herman when his turn came. He paid the lady, then walked outside to where Sandy and Ella were sitting on a bench. He sat down on another nearby. Herman couldn't help noticing that the two girls seemed to be crying. Are you OK? he asked. We're just so sad, said Ella. And we don't know why, said Sandy. Oh dear, said Herman, in a very concerned manner. He tore open the crisp packet and was immediately overcome by the strong smell of cheese and onion coming from inside. He reached inside the packet, but instead of pulling out a crisp, he found a large chunk of cheese and a slice of very stinky onion. The smell from the onion was so strong that it immediately made his eyes sting and he started to cry. Uh, excuse me, Herman said to Sandy and Ella, can I just see your packet of crisps? Sandy passed over her packet. Sure enough, there amongst the hand-fried pieces of potato crisps were large chunks of cheese and slices of raw onion. Herman had an idea. Do you know where these crisps are made, he asked. In a factory on an industrial estate just up the road, said Sandy. Can you show me the way there, said Herman. I have an idea why everyone in Sadsville is sad. Chapter 8 Where are you from? asked Sandy as they walked up the street towards the factory. A town not a million miles away, explained Herman. Random, said Sandy. But cool jacket, she continued. Is it Burberry? Um, no, it's my Uncle Arthur's, said Herman. I've seen something like that at the London Fashion Show Week reviews on the internet, said Sandy. Um, I don't use the internet, said Herman. It's a bit too blah, flashy, whizzy for my liking. Sandy spent most of her time on the internet, as did most of her friends, so she couldn't believe there was anybody that didn't. But there was something about Herman that she really liked. He reminded her of the old-fashioned characters from the books she'd read when she was younger, like Sherlock Holmes or Scott of the Antarctic. You're funny, she said. Is that good? said Herman. Well, since the people of Sadsville certainly need cheering up, I think it is, said Sandy. Well, I'm glad I'm here in that case, said Herman. And I think I may have solved the mystery as to why everyone is sad. Wow, you solve mysteries too, said Sandy in an impressed way. Are you a secret agent or a detective? 
Herman thought about it for a moment. Hmm, I've always thought of myself as more of a um, explorer or adventurer, he said. But maybe I am a detective too. Let's call you a problem solver, said Sandy. Herman Brimble, problem solver. Herman said it out loud. It had a nice ring to it. Can I help you solve some problems? asked Sandy. Of course, said Herman. Two heads are always better than one. Sandy offered to high-five Herman, but he looked confused. They shook hands instead, and they both smiled. Chapter 9 Herman and Sandy eventually arrived at an industrial estate on the outskirts of Sadsville. On the side of one of the factory units was a huge plastic model of a packet of crisps. Brian's Gourmet Crisp Factory, it said in big letters underneath. Herman and Sandy went into the factory reception area. Through a long line of windows, they could see the factory floor. There were conveyor belts, potato chopping machines and huge frying pans bubbling with hot oil. But it was a large wooden crate in the ingredients preparation area that caught Herman's eye. Printed in large letters on the side, it said, Grade A, extremely strong onions, from Scotland. By the side, a big machine was automatically peeling and slicing the onions and depositing them on a conveyor belt. The belt carried the raw, sliced onions across the factory to the crisp bagging area, where another conveyor belt carrying lumps of cheese joined it. Herman and Sandy watched as freshly cooked potato crisps were carefully loaded into individual packets and then bits of cheese and raw uncooked onions were added. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Herman said to Sandy. Just then a short energetic man with wild ginger hair bounced from behind one of the machines. Hello! he said in a strong Scottish accent. The name's Brian. Can I help you? Er, uh, Brian, said Sandy. That's not a very Scottish-sounding name, she continued. And if I'm not mistaken, your accent is... Scottish, Brian interrupted. I lass is Scottish born and bred. My real name's Angus Hamish Connor Douglas Gordon Donald Wallace McLachlan. Uh, but that wouldn't fit on the side of the crisp packet, and I thought Brian's crisps sounded better. And anyway, Brian continued, Brian means strength, and we like things strong in Scotland. Uh, so are your crisps made your own recipe? asked Herman. I passed down from my grandma and her grandma before that, said Brian proudly. Um, can we talk about your cheese and onion flavour in particular, asked Sandy, realising what Herman had realised a few moments earlier. Made with the finest ingredients, I said Brian. And uh, those would be, continued Sandy. Ah, uh, potatoes, said Brian. Uh, yes, said Herman. And? I strong Scottish cheddar cheese. Uh, yes, said Sandy and Herman loudly at the same time. And? I the strongest Scottish onions I can lay my hands on. And you use these cheese and onions as flavourings? asked Herman. Flavourings? Brian almost exploded with indignation. There's no artificial flavourings in Brian's gourmet crisps, I'll have you know. We use the real thing. Uh, as in? asked Sandy. As in whole bits of cheese and whole bits of onion, fizzed Brian. Uh, cooked onion? asked Herman, nervously. Brian's face turned the same colour as his hair. Cooked! 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 He bellowed in a voice so loud that it made all the pots and pans in the factory rattle. I'll have none of that namby pamby cut stuff flavouring Brian's crisps, he screamed. But won't the onions make? Herman started. People cry, Herman completed his sentence. I, of course, Brian said unperturbed, as my old granny used to say. If they don't have you streaming, then there's no point in being. Herman and Sandy looked at each other. Aha, uh -huh, they both said at the same time. 
Chapter 10 Over a cup of tea in the factory canteen, Sandy and Herman explained to Brian, once he'd calmed down, what had been going on. Everyone in Sadsville loved his crisps, especially the cheese and onion flavoured ones. But most cheese and onion crisps only contained cheese and onion flavouring, not actual lumps of cheese and actual raw onions. And the onions were making everybody's eyes water, so everyone in Sadsville was always crying, making them look and feel very sad. Oh, dearie, dearie me, said Brian. I wouldn't want that. Is there any chance we could try cooking the cheese and the onions to make a special, milder flavouring that we can use in some of the packets? asked Herman. Aye, for sure, agreed Brian. And soon he, Herman and Sandy were busy mixing ingredients in the factory kitchen. Later that day, the first packet of Brian's new, milder gourmet cheese and onion crisps rolled off the production line. Chapter 11 Sandy and Herman walked back to the bus stop in the centre of Sadsville. Already the new crisps were proving very popular and the streets were filled with happy, smiling faces. <laughs> There'll be no more tears in Sadsville thanks to you, Herman, said Sandy, giving him a big hug. You really are a problem solver. Perhaps... It's because you're not from Sadsville. Hmm, sometimes, you know, looking at things from the outside enables you to see things that you miss when you're looking at things from the inside, agreed Herman. Then, in a nervous way, he said, Would you like to help me solve other problems in the future, Sandy? I'd love to, said Sandy. Just give me a call. I'll text you my number. Herman looked at her. Blankly. I don't have a mobile phone, he apologised. Is there any way you could send me a letter or a postcard? <laughs> You're so funny, said Sandy. Herman, my funny, eccentric new friend. Cool, as you say, said Herman. <laughs> and they both laughed. Just then, a big double-decker bus appeared at the top of the road and pulled to a halt at the bus stop. Where is this bus going? Herman asked the driver. Not a million miles away, said the driver, and Herman was sure he saw him wink. Take good care of yourself, said Sandy, as Herman climbed aboard. See you again soon. You most certainly will, replied Herman, and he knew he would. They smiled and waved each other goodbye. Chapter 12 it seemed like no time at all before the bus was pulling up alongside the unfamiliar bus stop in the familiar street where Herman lived. Herman hopped off the bus, but when he turned round to thank the driver, the bus and the bus stop had disappeared. <laughs> How odd, said Herman. I guess that really was a magical bus. He opened the front door of his house and headed straight to the room with all the books and timetables. Still sitting on the table was the dusty old timetable of buses to the Vils. Herman opened it and then noticed the strangest of things. On the timetable of buses to Sadsville, it now said, Buses to Sadsville are now no longer needed. <laughs> That's good to hear, said Herman, but not to worry. There are lots of other villes for me to visit. He looked down the list and one place caught his eye. Tiredsville. Sounds like a sleepy kind of place, he said. Maybe I'll have an adventure there tomorrow, he yawned. I like solving problems, but right now I think it's cocoa and bed for me. The only problem is, he continued, where's my favourite mug gone? And he laughed to himself. If you're sad for any reason, or you have a problem someone like Herman could help you solve, then call or email the lovely people at Childline, who are there to support you, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Before that, do check there are no slices of raw onion in your cheese and onion crisps. Join Herman next time when he visits Hyardsville. 
Why is everyone there always so sleepy? Could it be something to do with Mr Harrington, the mattress maker? Help Herman solve the mystery. Here are Herman's tips if you're feeling sad. Firstly, are you feeling good sad or bad sad? Sometimes it's OK to feel sad, like when your holiday ends, your friend moves away or your pet dies. These things are all part of life and the feelings will pass. That's good sad. Bad sad is when someone is being mean or asking you to do something you don't want to do. Perhaps something is causing you to be worried or frightened or you feel sad for no real reason. Usually bad sad goes on for much longer. So once you've figured that out, what do you do? Firstly, try helping yourself. Do what Herman does and take a step back from the situation you're in to try and work out what's making you sad. What would make things better? Try to do something that makes you happy. Talk to a trusted friend. Sharing your feelings with a friend can make you feel better. Talk to a trusted adult like a teacher, a coach, parent or relative. They may be able to help you understand if you're feeling good sad or bad sad and help you in either case. Finally, ask for help. There are organisations like Childline with people who want to help you, so don't be afraid and get in touch. <laughs>